Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. Since 1949, Ruger has embodied the spirit of hunting in America. Ruger firearms are built to deliver the reliable and accurate performance that seasoned veterans demand and new hunters can trust. At Ruger, we believe that hunting is about more than just the thrill of the chase. It's about the freedom and opportunity that come with it. This is our heritage, and this is Ruger. Hey, everybody. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast. We are in Indiana in uh, one of my favorite humans in the world, a man that I dearly love, Jim Craig's beautiful museum. And um, we're also here with, I would say, one of the most iconic and legendary big game hunters in North America, Reg Collingwood. And um, what an honor to be sitting here with both of these men right now. Um, and I have, for the last two days, been listening to stories, which some could be repeated and others probably not, um, <laughs> of sheep hunts and mountain adventures from fighting fires to, I don't you know, yeah. lots of crazy things. Uh, everything in between. The two of you have been hunting together for how long? Uh, probably 35 to 40 years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it sits in the 70s. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Seventy-nine. Yeah, that's it. 1979. So 44 years. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah. We were, you know, when we come and meet, I mean, Jim would talk about different guys that were maybe were in the camp or yeah. he went out and we were just talking the other night about a uh, guy from Norway, Ole Peter, and he was on a one-month hunt and he kind of r- rattled my uh, uh, memory about the about the hunt, and it was uh, after forty four yeah. years. It's easy to forget a detail or two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but it, it then it all comes back, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you go, oh yeah, he got a goat here, and Jim was up there, and right, yeah. So Reg, how long did you run your area for? Because you recently sold. Yeah. Yeah. But you ran your area in northern BC for how long? Uh, we were um, in there seventy six. So uh, Jim was 75. one of your, almost one of your first hunters. Yeah, and then before that, I was my brothers were had an area beside that mm-hmm. that one, and at one time we had three areas, and then I sold one to a guy named Carl Ostmuller, mm-hmm. and then we just basically focused on the spats easy area because it was not really uh the infrastructure wasn't really set up the way mm-hmm. i like it and had to do a lot of trail cut and built cabins and uh a lot of work a lot of work put new trails in here and there yeah mm-hmm. and just for the record you guys this is reg's first um on camera podcast appearance so yeah <laughs> and jim's an old hat at this so yeah. we, well, he'll carry it so jim how did you end up meeting reg in 1979 and heading north well uh <coughs> i was looking to go stone sheep hunting and uh i'd killed a doll sheep and and uh and uh California Bighorn at that time, and was talking about stone sheep. And Jack Atchison Sr. out of Butte, Montana, he uh, got to know him pretty good through the years, and he's the one that told me this this Patizzi was a good game rich area, and it is. It's probably had more game than any area that I've ever been, different things. So we went, and I got a hunt with uh, an older gentleman who had got it, Fred Bear, named Charlie Abu and a uh, uh, tremendous hunter, uh, uh, Indian gentleman, and a great sheep hunter, wasn't he, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he taught taught me lots. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just uh, they lived in that area mm-hmm. and and grow you know many years they lived right in the area didn't they Red? Yeah. And uh, he was a great great sheep hunter. He could just tell you where the sheep was going to be. We see Ram over here, and we go they would mm-hmm. be there just like he talked them. Yeah, you know, told them to be there. Yeah, but it was great. And Reg, how did you end up getting all of these areas at one point? Like what what prompted that for you? Okay, I uh, I heard about the, uh, originally the Spats Easy and uh, the um, Tommy Tommy Walker went in there with uh, a native guide um, Moyes was his name, and he they trailed 300 miles across from uh, Vanderhoof up to that country and took horses in. Wow! And told him uh, at Moyes Creek, which was Flows into the upper Stikine River. He said, okay, across there, that's good game country. Mm-hmm. So Tommy got that um, just when they were starting to make areas in British Columbia. And uh, old Dalzell was north of that. Mm-hmm. And uh, Tommy Tommy was big in the sort of Boone Crockett stuff, too. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I knew Tommy when he was in town. He was elderly fellow then. I used to go go see him and talk about that. And then Bob Henderson was another guy that sort of ran it for him after that. And you know, there's been all kinds of stories. That was one place too. You could winter horses in the Spats mm-hmm. Easy, like you could on the East Slope. Mm-hmm. Well, they call it Kachika Thumb actually over there around Highland Post, and we we. we wintered horses and i actually wintered horses there when i first went there and uh so the same thing kind of brought you you and jim both to the same area was was a ex- kind of a secluded location with you know incredible hunting yeah and well i, well, I went went in there when we first took it over and we were rounding up horses you mm-hmm. know so I was, I was, <laughs> I could ride and, and stuff then, so, you know, I could go chase them and catch them, and I, sometimes we just have to break a horse to ride up to cold fish and get it in and work it a, a day or two, and then, well, just there, put try it and work. ride it. Yeah, just put it to work. <laughs> put it to work. <laughs> you don't mess around with the fancy stuff, you uh, just get them going yeah, down the trail. Yeah. yeah. Jim, um, so when you go in, um, or you, there's several ways you can get in with a with a plane. You've got a landing strip there, where you can go up a boat. Yeah. And once you get there, people can either hunt off a foot or on horseback. Yeah, we we went into Coldfish Lake uh, the first time when I was there, and actually, they had had a camp there. Tommy Walker had in uh, at one time. But Reg and them moved up to what they call Bug Lake and had tent camp there. They got a permanent camp later with cabins and stuff. But we hunted out of Bug Lake and uh, from there. And actually, I killed the first sheep in Culloden Creek with Charlie mm-hmm. and, and Dennis Hauser, who was guiding for those guys there. Yeah. How many of your stone sheep did you take with Reg? Because you've got eight. Yeah, I killed six. Six of them with Reg. Uh, yeah. Were you on every hunt or not? No, just a uh, few. He, not all of them. Not he all. was not, but he we we a lot of them more than mm-hmm. more of them than not. Mm-hmm. But sometimes I went with Slim Sawatsky and Tyler Brost and guys like that, different mm-hmm. guys. But Reg had a client who wanted to hunt with him, so I didn't care. He had good guides, mm-hmm. really the best in the business. So yeah. the first one was Charlie. And it, then, then my nephew he took Jim mm-hmm. uh, <coughs> on on one there too. Yeah, uh, Clayton, Clayton, yeah. Mm-hmm. Clayton Collingwood, and yeah, his buddy Ty Brost, and mm-hmm. they were all hockey players and tough. And well, Clayton's also a pilot. Yes, yes, yeah. and he flew a lot. Mm-hmm. Or, or, yeah, he was a pilot and one of the better all around people I've ever been around. Good horse guy, mm-hmm. pilot, and uh, cook. Everything rolled up in one. Uh, and yeah. uh, he was a great guide, too. Mm-hmm. Great sheep guide. Yeah, you also put together, Reg, a series of outfitter camps. 
like a guide camps, I guess, where people could come and learn how to. Oh yeah, all the tricks of the, the trade. The, the, <laughs> the, the, the guide schools. The guide schools. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And we did that um, originally. the The first guide schools were at at my place down by the river, and uh, when we uh, did them later on, um, Bob Henderson was was involved in it too. Um, Bob was actually uh, trained politically as he was going to be a lawyer and then he was supposed to be in the uh, Canadian uh, Parliament, you know. He was getting sort of uh, combed for doing that. Mm -hmm. and he ended up uh, in the spats easy and he never went back to that that life he and, just stayed and he he was also a pilot and he, he got this idea of doing guide schools and um so <laughs> as it ended up we ended down up at stan lancaster's place mm -hmm. and uh stanley was a famous outfitter big rough guy <laughs> and uh yeah we, we we had a cookhouse down there and uh we had horses and we we would you know start colts and then everybody had to learn how to cook and shoe a horse. You had to put a front shoe on and a hind shoe on um, to pass. And then we had uh, mechanics, so everybody knew how to run a chainsaw and actually mix oil for that. Mm -hmm. and, you know, put oil to mix uh, boats, you know. I, I, there was all kinds of stuff I used to hear that, you know, people thought the engine was getting too hot, so they pour water you know people hire kids and young people and they pour water in where the oil went or something you know <laughs> i'm like wow we need a school <laughs> we need to get we need to get people with skills uh -huh. and learn how to uh -huh. pack and and mm -hmm. learn how to carry that game out and horse care and all that stuff and first aid also for mm -hmm. uh, taking care of your clients and and learning how to cook so i'm, I'm sure like some of these students, you probably thought, oh, Lord, you're never going to survive in the backcountry. And then some of them, you're probably like, I'm going to hire you. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's got to be some that you just rolled your eyes when they sh showed up and <laughs> well, were terrified oh, yeah. a little yeah, bit. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Jim, Jim visited the school a few times coming out oh. from spring bear hunts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I went to school. And uh, Reggie even learned how to speak because – no foul language. And, oh, yeah. And he said, he made them understand the client's paying your wages yeah. so, uh, and everything proper, how to handle things. So it was pretty important, you know, mm -hmm. how kids, how to act in front of people. And uh, uh, it was, I was up a few years. I'd go up and visit them when they're at guide school. And it was interesting, you know. Those kids come out, a lot of good ones, really. Yeah. Like, you know, Jake and Brandon, them guys, you know, tremendous guides you know. mm -hmm. we learn the basics well uh, they learn from the best oh well, yeah mm -hmm. yeah and then just get down in the fundamentals like caping yeah. and stuff like that yeah so i was watching them you know it's just in detail it's how you learn you know mm -hmm. give a couple pointers like like some of your major takeaways that the maybe the green perspective guides would come in all gung-ho about that they would learn real quick a lesson or two just give us a couple stories i mean reg if you listen to reg tell stories we're holding back a little <laughs> bit here i'm not gonna lie we're holding back a little here this is a germane conversation but these two have me literally in stitches with yeah. these stories but just just you know one or two of your favorites yeah well you know they were there was uh you know, some guys, of course, you know, learn how to pack, and if mm -hmm. they didn't do it right, they were, ended up in some pretty big wrecks, you know. <laughs> and and uh, there was another guy, I used to call him Ball Peen Ben, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> what the heck? Anyways, we had, we had got a moose, and he said, oh, yeah, I'm going to carry all that. And I said, no, that's too much. Mm -hmm. And about, I got him up. We're <clears throat> actually going to pack board this out, and... Uh, he got going and he, he just got too much weight and he went forward and boy, he went face first in the water. I mean, we had to turn him over because um, he was going to drown. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. We turned him over and he's like a turtle on his back, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and we get him up and I said, uh, I think we have to drop like 25 pounds off that pack and then we'll get Keep get going. It, keep going. And uh, we'll come back and do another trip, you know. Pick it back up. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, there was uh, all kinds of characters out oh, there. Oh, I'm sure. But uh, it's good times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. humbling. Jim told a story the other night um, about a guy that thought he was real tough that come to sheep camp one time. Tell that story, Jim. It's a good one. Which was that with Christy? Uh, the guy that wrote the article about. Uh, oh, uh, it was uh, Never Brag. Yeah, and that one. Claire that Reese one. had written that in, for Outdoor Life in the early 80s. And, and I'd been around Reds, and Reds was a tough. And, you know, he was young, he's 20s, and I always remember little waist and big legs and strong shoulders and stuff, you know. So, uh, and this Claire Reese had written a story, Never Bragged, and he said, I come into camp and I was going to hunt goats with him, and he said, told him I was tough. I lived in Colorado and I was tough. And he said, then I think he parked it personal because he destroyed me. <laughs> <laughs> Reg he, destroyed him. Yeah, he, well. said, he, he said, I found out I wasn't tough. So he said, you better start faking knee injuries, anything to get sympathy. Because, uh, and I told guys this when they thought that was tough, you know, this story. You know, it was a good lesson. Mm -hmm. yeah, very good lesson. Jim was on a hunt with one guy who came into camp pretty braggadocious talking about how tough he was and he told him the story about the guy that thought he was tough and was humbled uh -huh. and that guy learned that he also wasn't tough and after the end of it he quit talking to his guide altogether <laughs> yeah. he just kind of shut down and yeah he was hunting with ty ty broast and uh, yeah he was goat hunting and and i told him we flew out on the airplane he told me he's a marathon runner and how tough it was and i said i told him the story he thought he would understand maybe but he didn't but Ty took him, and he said, uh, I saw him after the hunt, Ty, and the hunter was already out, but he killed a sheep, he killed a goat, and uh, and I asked Ty, I said, how did you do with him? And he said, he wouldn't speak to me, it was the second day. <laughs> <laughs> he said, <laughs> but you challenge those young 23-year-old guys, and it's, mm -hmm. ugh, tough, yeah. Yeah. tough people. Yeah. A great, great hunter, though, Ty was. I, he guided me with Slim Sawatsky once, and good guys, best in the business, you yeah. know. They had as good as people as ever was, you know, hunting, mm -hmm. guide for them. Yeah, all those, like, Ty, he, he still he still goes out, um, you know, moose hunting. He's, mm -hmm. he's got a very successful construction company. But, you know, he's always phoning, what's going on, what's going mm -hmm. on with the hunting, and I'm going moose hunting, and he's teaching his boys, too. And yeah. That he, you know, he's carrying that legacy on, and they're they're right into it. Reg had a lot of people. I met a lot of people, a guy from, like, Tim Mervin, and uh, and his wife, Jen, she cooked there. And, yeah. And uh, they, Tim wasn't a sheep hunter when he started, but Reg developed and he went on he's up in the Yukon now so it's and it's just very interesting people learn the basics from get the best you know mm -hmm. yeah yeah there's a lot, a lot of good uh, young guys like uh, Brandon Ponneth he uh, also he's up at Atlin and uh, him and I you know sheep hunting and actually uh, Brandon he, uh, he he wrote me a thing give me a, a scabbard and he said thanks for teaching me all this oh that's nice um and you know him him and i chased horses lots you know mm, this you do a lot of times when you have horses is mm -hmm. you chase them they have to wear a bell for a reason so you can find them yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> he's, he's a great hunter too. oh yeah pilot. <clears throat> we goat hunted together uh me and Rage and brandon and got stuck on the mountainside all night. And, and I told Reg, I, I'd killed several goats. And I said, this is, my, we land under a tree with a big bar. And Reg gave me a space blanket of some kind. <laughs> it would have been in the pack too long. And it wound them fall, just went to pieces when the wind blowed. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> it was very worthwhile at that yeah. point, yeah. We're, all those years of packing, it paid off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh and Red, I said, this is my last go, because every time you get stuck out all night, and, and uh, Red said, I wish I could say it was my last one, because he said, you can't go to hunt, you just get stuck every time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember that blanket. I said, oh, don't worry, Jim, I got fire going. I went and collected wood. I <laughs> actually found the horses in the dark, and I just fed them out for a while, and then I said, don't worry, I got a really good space blanket. <laughs> 
<laughs> just just fell apart. Yeah. Jim goes, that's really good. <laughs> really really <It> was, prepared. <laughs> yeah. But we made it. Yeah. It, was, it was not bad. It was uh, – Good experience. Brandon laid there and slept. He laid there and slept <laughs> on on the ground beside the fire, and just like. And I said, I just can't do that. I just, no. I would never sleep. But that's all right. We took care of him. Yeah, the old guys took care of the young guy. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. 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 Well, he knew you had his six, right? Yeah. Like he could relax. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. That's that's really good. I I have stayed out on the mountain a couple of times and. Once in your neighboring area, we slept out all night for a sheep, and I remember I climbed inside my extended stay backpack trying to stay warm because we didn't have a fire. And yeah, it was cold. I oh, mean, yes. we had M and M's to eat, and that was it because we didn't plan on being out all night. And it, the mountain has a kind of an interesting way of creating those lovely opportunities. I think everybody calls them type two fun. Type two. <laughs> yeah. 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 At the time you kind of question your sanity while you're there. And then afterwards you're like, that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, those uh, <laughs> sheep and goat hunts, you can spend a lot of nights out on, the, mm-hmm. on them things. Hey, you get stuck. It seems like goat hunting. You really get stuck a lot because you're a pie and, and this takes so long to get there and it gets dark on you, you know, so it's just tough, you know. Mm-hmm. Sheep the same way. I spent a lot of nights laying on the mountainside. But if you get a good fire, you got it made, no? You, it's if there's something to burn, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> if. <laughs> yeah, if it's not raining. You know. Yeah, or if it's not raining, exactly, yeah. yeah. yeah exactly right. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think, uh, Jim, we were talking like uh, even like there's just some of the girls that guide. Yeah. You know, and you, you've been out with them, and they're mm-hmm. they're pretty remarkable. I mean, yeah. it was kind of a man's world a mm-hmm. lot, but, uh, you know, we had, like, Esther Ka. Esther Ka, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then she, she ended up marrying uh, Kurt and McGee, and they're my neighbors now. And yeah. I mean, they're they're really good guides. They're, mm-hmm. they're a super team, and mm-hmm. they Top got notch, yeah. three kids now, and they got horses, and... Mm-hmm. They really want to get more into it. Uh, well, I hunted with Miguel Lamento and Kate Bryant in your yeah. neighboring area. Yeah. And heck, I mean, it was me and these two girls were 100 air miles from the nearest road. And Ron just drops us off and he's like, bye. Bye. <laughs> bye. See you, girls. <laughs> See you later. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, tough people. They're I mean. tough girls. There's oh, a lot yeah. of really tough girls. Yeah. And I'll tell you, those both of those girls could pack. Yeah. Like, like a like a man, and yeah. they're tiny little. Well, Miguel is a, a stout chick, but Kate's tiny. She's pretty slight, and and both of those women are are incredibly strong and good packers. And even Rena, mm-hmm. her I met her daughter the other day. Um, what's their outfit called? A uh, f- uh, fire mountain. Fire mountain. Rena's like fifteen year old daughter or something. She wrangles horses and does stuff with them oh, yeah. outfit. And she grabbed a hold of my hand and shook it. And I just, she about <laughs> broke it. I'm like, holy <laughs> smokes, kid. <laughs> She's eating her Wheaties out on that out- outfit. I mean, these girls are, they're strong. They're tough. And, uh, you know, you have a man that'll come into camp, I think. And a lot of times they'll, like, gosh, I got the girl for a guy, da, da, da. And these women will. No. Put well, them to shame. Oh, you know, boy. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's a humbling it's, experience for <laughs> yeah. a lot of uh, novice mountain hunters to go with some of these professional ladies that do this yeah, day does. in and day out. Yeah. K- Katie Arbach was another Katie, one. Katie Arbach yeah. was uh, mm-hmm. another one guy from a little short girl. Ooh, mm-hmm. Tough. I mean, mentally tough and physical tough, you mm-hmm. know, and could handle herself. You know, mm-hmm. it's unbelievable. You mm-hmm. know, just amazing what they could handle. Yeah. Yeah. We got Rachel Attila up there, and she's been guiding and yeah. running horse strings. And I mean, she's mm-hmm. definitely put in some time and some years as well. Yeah. Lots of ladies, actually. I mean, it's it's actually when I go to Blackstone and hunt Fan and Rams with them, they have a gal that guides there, and I her name's kind of escaping me right now. But um, but I told her I was like, man, will you be my guide? Because it'd be really awesome to yeah. to go with another woman and and have that experience it is great you know yeah. to, there's a lot of them they know they've got to be tough to do it <clears throat> mentally they're prepared you mm-hmm. know you know uh, i think that's the main thing just the mental yeah. aspect of it you know um heidi good freak yeah. yeah and she just uh actually i think she's uh she actually bought a place beside me now yeah so she's hauling some yeah. horses up there she's mm-hmm. all into those horses and she was she was a sheep guide for a mm-hmm. long time. 
Cassidy Karen's another one who's she's incredible guide and outfitter. It's it's incredible the change that's happened. I think in the hunting community where you know the women were kind of stuck behind cooking and now they're more on the forefront of the hunt and and responsible for the success of a lot of these hunts and I think that really goes to show uh the power of the determination that these ladies have had because you know a lot of you know you think back you know when you started your outfit how many girls were guiding ridge uh none uh, my brother's daughter Ray's daughter carrie was doing some guiding mm -hmm. and she ended up being a, a lot more in the fish guiding and yeah her husband have a steelhead camp but mm -hmm. they're still out there in the bush you know mm -hmm. making it off the land there yeah, I've got it. She's been with me on some goat hunts, you know. Yeah. Tough. Because yeah, just <laughs> little but tough, you mm -hmm. know. Could pack twice as much as I could, you know. And, uh, yeah, it's been good, you know. It's amazing. Uh, but I think we get, get more women in the outdoors, and it shows you can do it. You know, yeah. that's half of it, you mm -hmm. know. It makes some women more comfortable when they got a woman guide, too, which mm -hmm. is a real plus, you know. And uh, a lot of times you thought they couldn't make it, but they can't because most of them are determined, mm -hmm. you know, a lot more mentally tough, prepared than a lot of men are. Yeah. yeah. And, and so much of hunting, is, especially mountain hunting, is mental. I mean, Jim, you can walk people through a little bit, too, on some of the physical stuff that you've overcome uh, from hunting with a broken foot to, I mean, what your body really will, will is capable of. Well, we've been lucky in life because... Pretty good medical care can help you, but you know I've had, went on a hunt with Reg one time, and I had a was it an accident uh, four weeks before the hunt, and and uh, broke a foot, and uh, I had a doctor who was in sports medicine, Doctor Matt Parmenter, and uh, he helped me a lot mm -hmm. uh, with first with things to get over fast healing, and I went on the hunt and uh, I couldn't get around real good, but I made it and was successful and. Uh, but I had understanding guide. Thing. Jim shows up in camp and he's like, hey, by the way, Reg, my foot's broke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That That's just what every outfitter wants to hear when their hunters show up. <laughs> by the way, I'm going sheep hunting with a broken foot. <laughs> we'd, we'd hunted before, so yeah. I didn't want to interrupt their schedule they had so i thought I'll you didn't them. want them to tell you you couldn't come <laughs> no. let's be well, honest yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah i I, uh, I was gonna do it one way or the other uh. so and eat some pain pills and keep going you know that's mm -hmm. the way you do it and you know i've survived the bear attacks and everything like that so it you should tell the bear attack story uh, you kind of skip over that real quickly but um well i was hunting big horns with albert Cooper, which Reg knows real well, he's a legend in British Columbia <laughs> and down in the Mount Assiniboine country and uh, hunting bighorns. And, and uh, I had been able to uh, hunt with Albert some elk and different things. So, uh, and he had some tremendous bighorns in that area. So we went and uh, I was very blessed, let's put it this way, uh, to survive it I killed a pretty nice big horn and started down the mountain and got got grabbed a grizzly so that it circled us and come down on us and, but i had good people were around me and uh the the gal that ran jim's gun store tammy uh was with jim she had an elk tag and they'd seen some elk and they'd also seen these rams so jim said well I'll go We'll get a stock on this ram, and when we come back, if we see those elk, we can kind of do a double up. <clears throat> so Tammy was with Jim. Now, mind you, he owns, owned for over 40 years a really successful yeah. gun store here in Indiana, ran it out of his home, and Tammy knows everything about guns. I mean, she ran the gun store for Jim. She, I mean, nobody gave Tammy any guff, and she knows her way around a firearm, and when that bear grabbed a hold of Jim... Tammy saved his life with her firearm. Yeah, she was very fortunate. She, uh, it was how it come about. Albert had met her at the sheep show, and uh, and I had was going to hunt sheep with him, and he said, why don't you come up when he comes up and spend seven days, and we'll get you an elk and a mountain goat. And uh, so uh, she just happened to be there, and he had a Canadian 
RCMP with their uh, guidance, named Barney Weismiller uh, from from Invermere, and uh, and they come down elk hunting that day, pretty close to where me and Doug Gertner was spotted the sheep, and they went up with us, and it was a blessing, it was a godsend, that's how it happened. But she kept her composure, and she had a, she liked to shoot. She was one of the tough girls, so she always shot her little gun with a three thirty eight. So, mm -hmm. and uh, and she was packing it that day, and she saved all of us because the guys didn't have guns, and she killed him after shooting four times. But uh, Jim had his firearm with him, but by the time you realized the bear was coming, you tried to close the bolt on your round, and just yeah. you were just a little too slow. Yeah, I was about. I uh, the, saw the bear probably two seconds before he had me, and you couldn't get a shell in the chamber. I had it carrying it with the magazine pool and uh, coming down. It was your fight, uh, sliding down a lot and falling. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh, he just come in, he grabbed me and took off carrying me by my arm and uh, shaking me and throwing me. And, and uh, her and uh, Barney Wisemiller, and Barney would get him off of me for a second. She'd shoot. And then he'd get me again and shake me and throw me, and uh, she'd shoot again. And so she ended up shooting him four times finally and saved all of us, really. But she kept her composure. And I always tell people uh, she'd done a lot of interviews after that because I was afraid she'd get trip, tripped up by the anti-hunting or anti-gun people. And she always told everybody, I couldn't have done it. Uh, God done it for me. And mm -hmm. uh, and. and Nobody would ever answer or say a word after that. Cause mm -hmm. She said, I couldn't have done it on my own because she was a very religious kid who had, very, had a life scare with a brain aneurysm before that. So she was a very religious kid, and it carried her through at mm -hmm. the right time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jim, the, Tammy and, and was the RCMP went off the mountain that night? Uh, they went off the mountain, and, and the RCMP, he, they went to camp, and got some sleeping bag to cover me up with because it was real high it was four hours up and Ooh, you had a compound fracture in your legs legs and, and my hands were messed up bad ribs broke I'm bad on one side and uh, and a lot of cuts and bruises but uh but anyway they her and albert rode out about 25 miles that night to get help and uh and uh, the RCMP, Barney, he made it back. He recruited a resident hunter, and they come back and pick me up, uh, or fix me up that night. But we had a fire started, and it's just, I survived it. So it was, that was about it, you know. The caveat to this, though, is Jim's laying there by a fire, trying not to slip into shock, probably partially in shock, as a second grizzly bear slips in, grabs his pack, grabs his ram, and he has to sit and lay there and listen to another grizzly bear eating his ram right right, right. with him. And, and he didn't say a word because he was terrified that everybody would leave him. Yeah, he was about 20 feet from me across a little, and a little, little ditch there. And, and uh, I could hear the rocks coming down, so I knew what it was. So, but... Doug Gertner, who was with me, he went down was carrying wood up. He was right at Timberline, so he was carrying wood up, and I could hear him singing. But uh, but the bear got the backpack, and he was in a green backpack. I never forgot it, and in uh, the head, and, uh, and all was in it for a full life size mount. And uh, next morning, there was nothing left. Uh, so I had never told Doug anything. I'd heard anything because it just. Uh, you know, you're kind of in shock, like Christy said, and you, you, you was hurting bad enough. You didn't really care, you know, mm -hmm. uh, at that time, you know. So. so he never did get his ram. The no. bear took the ram. And Jim doesn't count that towards his eighth finales, so now he's like seven yeah. and three-quarter on his <laughs> finales because well, he's not counting that one bear that the grizzly took from him. I personally I, would count it, but, I, you know. I, I don't... Uh, uh, like to count something you ain't got so. uh, and uh no i just and, I, and it really meant little to me the finals compared to you know the experiences we've had in life mm -hmm. is where i tell people it's that's the meaning for me like we men and reds covered a million miles together and uh, 
and the people, Albert Cooper and, and, and uh, guys like that, you know, and up on with Stan, uh, Stevens and guys mm-hmm. in Northwest Territory. But who you've been with is, is what the meaning is of life, you know. And Terry Anderson, California, and so different places, you know, just tremendous people, you know. Mm-hmm. I've been fortunate. I was uh, flown into Ridge's camp one time when Jim was out moose hunting and uh, stopped into Ridge's camp and had uh, coffee and pastries and whatnot with Leanne. And, I mean, Leanne's been on, on a lot of your journeys as well. What oh, it, yeah. It's yeah, incredible. She, went, she never got a sheep hunt because she or not physically or legs messed up some. Mm-hmm. They're accidents. But, uh, but she got to go a lot and had a lot of friends mm-hmm. in the hunting business. We've had a tremendous amount of friends in the hunting community, you know, it was, Really mm-hmm. good. Mm-hmm. That's what counts in the world. A lot of times, it's people you're with. And mm-hmm. I always look. I've had some great guys to, uh, and experiences, you know, with people, and you become great friends mm-hmm. through the years. Like me and Reg. Just, well, you guys are like brothers. Yeah, you are you're around <laughs> almost like family. I, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I went up on a lot of hunts and that I didn't intend to go. You know, but we go and have fun. I go back winter trapping trips with them. I've been up there 20 times doing that in the winter time. And just, they're like family to me, all the Collingwood, Ray and Reds and Clayton and all of them, you know, and done some waterfowl shooting down in South Catchin when yeah. Ron had come, their brother in between them. Mm. And, uh, and then right. you see the Collingwood's in action, Clayton agitating them all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and Jim was, you know, go, teaching my boys uh, shotgun, and, and yeah. uh, the, we we got them to retrieve a lot of the. That's perfect. Yeah, get them young boys. <laughs> you don't boys. need a dog. That's <laughs> <No>. right. <laughs> they ran out there and grabbed them geese and ducks, and yeah, we had Clinton Mark with us, and and uh, Ray had made wings for them, and uh, Clint was real little. Uh, he, <laughs> Look, he was a decoy, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah. Uh, we had a lot of fun together with those guys. We were down in Saskatchewan, waterfowl hunting. And uh, it was just it become like family to mm-hmm. us and, uh, through the years, you know, uh, real close. No matter where you pursue the wild, never leave home without Onyx Hunt. Onyx gives hunters the confidence to apply and draw tags in areas they've never set foot in, extending hunting seasons and opportunities. Always know where you stand with public and private land layers, unit boundaries, and more. Onyx can even be downloaded directly to your phone for use when you don't have service. Wherever you pursue the wild, hunt with Onyx. Yeah, we, we went to a couple, couple of the overseas hunts. Yeah. Yeah, Mongolia. Yeah, that was... Went to Russia together. And Reg lost a little bit of weight over there. <laughs> 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 he loved the food. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was great. <laughs> <laughs> rough. <laughs> the stories from that are pretty yeah. pretty rough on yeah. the food part there. Uh, yeah. It makes me not want to go, but it might do me some good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. It's you know, old we, experience, though. So. Yeah. Yeah, we... Uh, uh, I I I I taught Mongolia. I liked uh, Mongolia. I did too. Hey, yeah, that was that was good. Yeah, we had um, a lot of fun there. And and uh, and uh, what'd you like about it? Um, I think the, the like the people and the <coughs> wide open spaces. Like, there's only three million people in Mongolia. There's 13 million horses. Oh wow! And uh, I. I you know, we were horse lovers, yeah, they are, yeah. And then out in the camp, it, it was a lot more uh, relaxed, mm-hmm. you know. Um, we went to uh, it, just the whole, um, we went to the um, prayer uh, mm-hmm. chapels, mm-hmm. Yeah. and they had the bells. Oh, yeah. And, you, you'd, and then the, the barrels, you'd spin them and... And we, you know, really cool things like where Genghis Khan had his camp on the oh, wow. Gobi Desert. Right. Yeah. And yeah. his wife's buried there under all these rocks. And then you put uh, prayer ribbons on the mountains. And and I thought that was really cool. Mm-hmm. And then this water coming out of the, out of the middle of the desert. Mm-hmm. He kept 100,000 horsemen there for yeah. his 
attacks. So, yeah, it's a, a little it, different than Canada. A little different. Yeah, it's a different. And the people are pretty friendly there. Mm-hmm. That's that yeah. meant a lot. Cause we mm-hmm. had no trouble with yeah. people. A lot, lot. They went well to welcome me in to eat and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And so you, you had a good time. And but it's it was a good experience. That's for sure. And uh, uh, it was just a different world. But it it's it's just the the people was friendly. I think mm-hmm. that's just it. What made it, you know, treated us real good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The polar yeah. bear you said was one of the ones that was hard though. A and polar bear, you just yeah, it's just a hard hunt because the weather is a big factor there, mm-hmm. and then sometimes communication is not the best in the world. But you're out on the ice and for days and days and days, you know, so it's just pretty tough on you, especially the wind blowing. And, it's just a rugged hunt. Did you just do that one just for the mental challenge? Oh, I, I wanted to see it. I like to see everything and experience it, yeah. you know. And I went polar bear twice. and and But it was East Arctic and the West both. And, and I enjoyed it. It was just just to get out and do it and see the country. I like history. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you learn uh, about history and you read a lot. And so that meant a lot to me, you know. To, to see it, you know, with your eyes. That's mm-hmm. the way you learn, you know. And uh, you just see what people went through in their lifetime. So uh, we got it easy today with gear oh, yeah. and stuff compared to what the people in the past have done, you know. So it's it's really a learning lesson, yeah. Yeah, I've seen some of the gear you guys used to hunt in, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> we don't even have to go back to ancient civilization. We can go back oh. 40 years and yeah. appreciate how much uh, gear has improved. Oh, my God. Uh, tents and shelters and yeah. boots and, yeah. I mean, it, we're we're pretty darn spoiled anymore. I mean, it's, I mean, we're, what we consider roughing it is, I mean, we're, I mean, there's a very rare time on the mountain where you're truly, you know, uncomfortable with your gear unless you just have really bad gear. Right, I mean, they've right. t- they've come so far with shelters and t- oh sleeping my. bags and boots and coats and that you really don't. Even if the conditions are miserable, you know, typically you know you got a good meal to eat. And we've got food that tastes good. We've got shelters that'll keep us dry, bags and stuff that'll keep our gear dry, and and, and then the rest of the. I- I- Misery is in between our ears. Right. It's, you know. It's just temporary inconvenience yeah. is all it is, you know. So you know you can, if you got a camp where you can dry out at night and stuff, get warm, it makes a big difference, mm-hmm. you know, because it's not like backpack hunts where you're just living with what you got, you know, and mm-hmm. crawling in a cold tent and wet, you know. So it's a different world. But, but even that's gotten easier. Yeah, I it mean, has. it's, it's with, with, with the innovations of... Right. Of yeah. equipment it's gotten. Right. I mean, like, there's rarely a sheep hunt that, I mean, this new food that they've got, you go sheep hunting and stuff, and yeah. you boil hot water, and the food is good. You feel like you're eating in a restaurant the with best. the most spectacular view in the world. I mean, yeah. I mean it, it's unbelievable, the comforts that we get to bring compared to when you started sheep hunting. I mean, oh, exactly. it's night and day difference. Yeah. And Some of these guys in your pictures, they're wearing jean jackets. Oh, yeah. That was pretty common hunts. in the old days. Yeah. You know, like, you what is what going you, on? You wore what you had. Yeah. And, uh, and then you had wool and, uh, for really wet and cold weather. But mm-hmm. wool, but th- you didn't have gear. And mm-hmm. uh, you know, optics is another thing. Glass, you know, mm-hmm. when I started, there wasn't many good binoculars. You know, you couldn't hardly find them. You'd get headaches from Ice drain, and, mm. and especially like on sheep hunting and stuff where you're really on glass a lot or hunt big bears, you know. It's just the gear is just so much easier anymore. Mm-hmm. A lot of great gear, yeah. All right, Reg, so first-time sheep hunter, they show up in camp. What are the do's and don'ts? Uh, the, because there's got to be a couple things that people commonly do that you just go, oh, Lord, not again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> the big thing is, is to pr- practice shooting and not just bring a new rifle. Yeah, don't just go buy. buy. Uh, uh, practice yeah. shooting. And uh, um, I've, I've seen that end up. Usually we... we we shoot the rifles before we go, and, mm. and some of them aren't even hitting the box. Yeah. And we're like, uh-oh. 
Yeah, we're in trouble. So let's get this honed in. And sometimes there's lessons, which I've learned a lot from Jim on, hey, Jim, you know, what about this? And what do you think of that? And and dialing the, the rifle in, and, and that's, a, that's a start you mm-hmm. get, if it's going to be a, a rifle hunt and yeah. getting that. Uh, new boots. Oh, boy. Um, people show up with a left and a right or i mean a left and a left not a left and a right or two sizes or they show up with new boots and they haven't worn them yet Mm. yeah and it could be okay because a lot of you know we were talking about all these boots and stuff um when we first started we never had gore-tex boots and stuff yeah no no we used to just grease them up as best we could but um now some of them you can put on and kind of go but you should wear them um, oh, around the house anyways. Yeah. Just okay. put them on and make sure that they're two of the same size and that you have two, uh, a left and a right versus two lefts or two rights. Cause that can happen in a shoe store. They switch them around on accident. And, and then <coughs> guys wanting to, uh, bring all kinds of, um, electronic stuff and watch movies and stuff at night that, that, like actually carrying portable stuff like that, and I said, uh, <laughs> "No, no, no, no. Mm-hmm. This, this is this is all business. Mm-hmm. Sheep hunts are very expensive. This is all business, and I don't want you, you know. You want to be dialed in on what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Mentally yeah. invested. And in mentally the invested in the and at night, you know, you're going to be tired. You need to sleep and." Um, I mean, that th- those kind of, kind of things. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I, of course I've taken guys that, you know, um, you don't want to get too picky, but if you're too picky, then you'd you be, be prepared to come back. Empty handed. Empty handed because mm-hmm. I, I've shown lots of guys, well, that's a good ram. Well, I don't like the color <laughs> yeah. of the sheep. And I was like, well. Okay, we're so not grocery shopping and we'll, picking an apple. We'll go find find another one. You find another one. Well, that one's got dots on it or something, and yeah, it it happens. Mm-hmm. And then you know, then then wrecks happen. You know, I had one where I uh, actually found twenty two rams, and there was at least four or five good rams, and one particularly good ram, and he turned it down. Just turned it down, and uh, so found some others, and he turned them all down. And then I, I said, "Well, I got, I'm got to, uh, I can't help you. I'm going to give you this other guide that was with me. I had two, and an apprentice guy with me that was really good. That ended up being a really good sheep hunter, uh, Jason Trudell. And I said, I, I have to go back and choose some horses because I had to move to another camp mm-hmm. and." I always reset the shoes and away we go, and I have to go set that up. And that day, he uh, because he was tired and doing climbs, you st- you don't realize how you're wearing out. No. And they st- they actually went down, moved camp, found another two sheep, and there was a one, and he l- liked it. So they had to go to camp, and then he he just fell asleep on his horse and fell off. Oh no! Just kaplunk. <laughs> Called plunk and separated shoulder. Hunt, then he never hunt, hunt over. Hunts over. <coughs> next morning I get a call. <laughs> a call, or uh, no, uh, next morning I'm back at the camp and a helicopter lands and they said, "Do you know where this camp is?" And I said, "Oh yeah." Well, you got a guy there with a shoulder uh, injury. Way I jumped in with him, went went there and. Those two guys said, yeah, he just, he said it was just like he just went plunk, landed on a rock, and uh, that was the end of the hunt. Yeah. And, he, you know, now he did like a sheep, but he's not getting there right now. No, he's now. not going so, there now. Mm-hmm. But it, he did come back, and I took him out again, and we got a sheep uh, mm-hmm. uh, a following year. Mm-hmm. But uh, you, you don't... There's very limited amounts of sheep, and of any sheep, really. And but. you're only you have only so many physical resources, right? You know, before you fatigue as well. I always said nine days was kind of most guys. 
the ninth day is kind of where the, the, the game starts to change. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, or mentally whipped, then, you yeah. know, if you don't watch. It, you know, it's it becomes a, a uh, physical and mental thing then. Yeah. Jim, what was your longest time on the mountain on a sheep? I've been on there 23 days mm-hmm. and uh, another one 21 days. And them are tough because mentally, it's not all physical, it's just mentally. You mm-hmm. get beat down. You got to keep yourself. Uh, confident you mm-hmm. can do it and it's like elk hunting or anything mm-hmm. i've always had confidence it would happen and i found out most times it's true you you'll have the opportunity now where you seize it or not is a different story you know you have to keep yourself mentally prepared all the times because the shot may happen in the last 10 minutes you got of mm-hmm. a day and you just got to mentally be prepared and physically prepared the best you can do you know you can only do so much but but you just got to be the best physical shape you can get and uh, the mental shape is as much as anything it's just Mm -hmm. be prepared because you don't know when you're going to stuck five days in a tent it can't see nothing but and you got to keep yourself up most people get depressed pretty fast you know they're mentally whipped they think it's easier Mm -hmm. and uh, i tell people you're in a different world yeah i get People call me and use like as a reference, and uh, I used to say like when you're going with this guy, they can get you a sheep. Well, I learn don't say that because uh, I'd say they can do their part. Uh, you have to you, do yours. You can do yours, and I said that's being prepared mentally and physically, and uh, it's just it's anymore. It's, it's just mental physical mm-hmm. and financial too yeah. because you waste a lot of money and a lot of guys save a lifetime for a hunt you mm-hmm. and you're real prepared i think you read too many stories or so see too many videos of success and it's all the bad stuff's cut out you know you just got to realize it. and the weather is a big factor of sheep hunting mm-hmm. it's just fogged in and wind blowing you can't see stuck in a tent raining miserable good and get, have good gear you know yeah. like red said and be prepared shoot and uh practice and stay within your capabilities mm-hmm. you know because like me and red's talk we you gotta stay within your capabilities i people ask me what my shot what i want i said i want to be 25 yards if i could yeah. but but <laughs> as close to where i can't miss mm-hmm. and uh but you guys be prepared out i always like to tell people i don't want to go much over 300 because too many weather factors out there. Wind mm-hmm. is a big factor in the mountains. You don't know the how the air currents are. So it's it's just a, a learning thing. And uh, But just prepare yourself because you can make it miserable or you can make it uh, as, the best you can. You yeah. know, and you want to do your part. Do you, you, I always wanted um, to do everything I could, cut down every air, you know, mm-hmm. and... Uh, sometimes i've had unsuccessful sheep hunts not with these guys but uh, but i have been because you just weather factor is a big thing you can have 10 to 14 days in a row just horrible weather and the wind blowing and the fog and you got to see it's interesting i a lot of people say well you know i probably should get in better shape for my sheep hunt <laughs> but i don't have time for this or that and it's like if you make a practice of being uncomfortable in a comfortable setting at home, when you're uncomfortable in an uncomfortable setting <laughs> out there, it's going to be a lot easier. Because if you think about it, you know, you think you're tired at home when you work a day. And sure, I give you that, you're tired. But it's not the same kind of tired no, no, as definitely. you're going to feel out there. So, you know, if you're getting ready to go for a mountain hunt of any kind, you know, forcing yourself to get used to kind of functioning and still pushing through on that little bit of lack of sleep and, you know, doing the weight lifting because you're, you're going to inevitably carry a heavy pack and it's not flat. Um, and, and putting in that little bit of time being uncomfortable at home where, you know, okay, at the end of this, I get to go in my kitchen and have a cup of coffee yeah. or, you know, what, sleep in a nice soft bed tonight. I did, uh, a hunt with Stan up there and I went and bought this fancy new thermal rest bed of some kind it was supposed to be really warm because it was a cold hunt in October and first night out it popped 
<laughs> you know? So I spent the week sleeping. Well, the first night I slept on pine boughs and I froze. It was cold. And luckily we bought these little pads to sit on. But, you know, I spent, I was backpacking, carrying heavy weight, and my sleep wasn't great the whole time we were out there because my gear failed me. And you think about it, if you can get a little used to being uncomfortable at home, when you get in a situation like that, you know, Very true. It, it helps you kind of adapt and overcome. So instead of getting frustrated in that situation, you know, I just made the best of it and kept going, you know. And even though I wasn't getting the best of sleep and I was I was colder than that I wanted to be because you're on the ground. And, and so there's all those things, too. So, I mean, if you can't pack 60 pounds at home on a flat driveway for an hour, you're not going to pack that same 60 pounds for 12 days up a mountain or 40 pounds or whatever it is that, you know, you're packing. I mean, you got to be able to put a little into it at home um, to get the most out of your experience up there because you're paying a lot of money to be miserable (laughs) in some capacities. I mean, it's the greatest thing you'll ever do, but it's also hard. Very hard, you know, and it tests you, you know, it's just, you, it's a big surprise to a lot of people how tough you have to be, you know, and stick with it and just don't say anything and, mm-hmm. and don't complain, mm-hmm. you know, don't whine and because nobody likes that. You nobody know? wants to listen to anybody nope. whine. I had nope. a guy on a hunt one time that was crying. Yeah. It was I've very seen. uncomfortable. I've seen it. <laughs> it was oh, yeah. very uncomfortable and uh. when he's sitting there sobbing. Um, and, and, you know, you're like, oh, Lord, this is, this is not good. <laughs> he's <Not> crying. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> nobody very, wants very to be dark. around that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's other issues going on, I think, when someone's crying. Like oh, boy. Yeah, yeah. I, I just... Uh, but you both, I guarantee, have seen grown men cry. Oh, God. I don't even like to talk about it. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've had a few things to say to a few of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Had too much comfort in our life. Yeah. yeah. Like you say, you got to learn to kind of get uncomfortable at home. Yeah, and, that's right. And, uh, and do things that are uncomfortable. And the mountain hunts will really test you, I think, more. Oh, boy. More than anything in the more. world. More than you got in you sometimes. It reveals the character of oh, yeah. people. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's very character revealing. But, you know, anybody can fake it for a day or two out there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But you get a good grind in and you really see who someone is. You have to learn. The game ain't tied up for you. It's no. You got to find it, you know. And like hunting sheep is what makes it really tough. Some of them are really tough to find, you know, in their certain areas. And, and you spend a lot of time just looking and and just look, 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 and keep looking, you know. And, but it's interesting, you know, if you make it that way. Yeah. No, it, uh, it'll it take you places that you never dreamed that you could ever see. And, and the sad thing for me is sometimes, you know, you leave one of these places and, and as the plane takes off or you unsaddle your horse and you think back at where you've been, you know, in your heart, you might never see that country again. And no. it just makes you sad. Right, duh. You know, yeah. it just makes you sad because it's it's some of the best accomplishments, most wonderful memories you'll ever live. And with the, your, the probably typically what it turns out to be, you know, the most cherished relationships with hum, other humans that you'll have. Right. And, and to know that, man, I might never feel this ground under my feet again. That's very true. It always makes you a little sad when you leave. It does. And what also is what brings you back. It's exactly right. Yeah. You do things you don't think you'll ever do. You know, you think you're going on one sheep hunt or two hunt. It's very addictive, you know, mm-hmm. and like especially sheep and stuff like that. It looks like a disease or a drug, you know, and you think, well, I've been on one. I think, God, what am I doing this for? And, then, you, you know, before you get home, you're ready to go again, mm-hmm. you know. So it's part it, of it. I was listening to some guys talk about how they can't afford a hunt the other day at SCI and I'm listening to this man I can't afford this I can't afford that and I I looked at him and I said well do you do you drink Starbucks coffee Mm -hmm. he says yeah I love it and I'm like how often do you drink your coffee and he says well I go probably you know three or four days a week and you know dude's got three kids so he's buying hot chocolate and doing this and that Mm -hmm. and I'm like well you're spending you know what five to $8,000 $8,000 a year for you and your kids to drink coffee at a boutique store. Don't tell me you can't save your money to, to go live out the adventure of a lifetime. Your priorities are what's wrong. 
not your checkbook, not your paycheck, uh, is where you spend that money. Very true. You know, you, I tell people, I've hunted up a lot of new cars, and, uh, and, but they'd have been rusted <coughs> out anyway, so it wouldn't make no difference. But I got memories, and, and they've spent a fortune on vehicles, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and which Yeah, was, they're spending eight $900 a month on a car payment. <laughs> yeah, and you, you just do things like this, and, and uh, you, you what your priorities are. Mm-hmm. And you just got set aside, and I always had funds that I was put back and mm-hmm. save and work, just work harder, work mm-hmm. overtime, work, do this, and do this to make money. Drive a paid-for car. Oh, yeah. And Don't have a car payment. That's right. That's <laughs> yeah. the way you do it. Put that's, that money into a hunting fund. And right. That's what I've done in life. Yeah. And we work two jobs to try to save money mm-hmm. and uh, and don't charge yourself from living, but but you've got to save for a goal, mm-hmm. and that's where kids has a big problem. They want to see everything. You've mm-hmm. got to want, you know, and, and the thing is just putting your priorities mm-hmm. in order. If you've got a goal, stick with it until you'll make it. Anybody can do it. It's just if you want to bad enough. Reg, you got a client that kind of sticks out in your mind that maybe had sacrificed a lot for the opportunity to hunt with you. Um, well, w- what comes to mind, I uh, t- took two fellows that were uh, mentally, or not mentally, but physically challenged, mm-hmm. like in a wheelchair, and uh, the other was a paraplegic, and they both wanted to hunt moose with me. Well, th- they phoned me, and they said no one would take me, and uh, <laughs> I said, okay, I'll take you, and... Uh, uh, I actually had a boat built so I could put them in a wheelchair in the front of the boat. Wow. And strap them down so they would be, uh, wouldn't fly out. <laughs> <or something>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we <laughs> but, need to secure them to the boat, yeah. But, but I, I think um, that that was a highlight of my, my um, sort of guiding career. Um one was uh, the first one. I uh, he, he 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 couldn't use his dexterity of his finger, but he we had to get a tripod, mm-hmm. and um, he would pull his whole arm back mm-hmm. to shoot. Anyways, long story short, we were going up the river, and I pulled over. Um, well, I actually had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and the uh, truth be told uh, truth be told i said hey you know let's pull over here i'm gonna check and i actually saw some moose tracks uh, and stuff and i walked over and i kind of standing there because he, he's in the boat so it's it's a big deal to get him out of the boat right and i i just kind of turned my head to the left and i looked and the at the same time this big bull moose and he was a record bull he turned and looked at me and we're both looking at one another, and I went, wow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, let's put this into action. So I s- kind of slinked back down, and I said to the, I had a, a, a young guy with me um, that was in the military. And he, I said, I need to take you so you can carry him. And then I had the, the, the fellas help her. Um, that would help him in his cabin and stuff. And I said, there's a big bull moose right there, and I think we can get him. Well, the moose kind of spooked because he had a cow and calf, but we we carried him, you know, in there. And then we he was, you know, uh, I finally got the bull moose at the end of this meadow, and I called him, and we got him standing up. And he was looking through the scope of that rifle, and we got him holding him up. And when he saw the, the massive buck fever, mm-hmm. <laughs> he, he had massive buck fever. He started like just shaking. shaking and all over. And he goes, "Look how big it is! Oh man!" And I said, "You know." But the moose, he went away. Buggered off. Buggered off. I could still see him a little off in the trees, but. We didn't get them. And, I mean, we tried, but, yeah, you know, and that was first day. But then after that, we would always go up the river, 
and I would climb up. We would climb up in glass, and then finally we found another bull, and we carried him down this gravel bar, and I carried the wheelchair and put it in the water. I said, oh, man, i got to get you out in the water more so we can get the angle on him. Pretty soon I'm in I'm in the water. He's in the water. He doesn't even feel it. I no. do. I do. Yeah. And uh we got he got that moose. Oh wow. And he, he just cried mm-hmm. yeah, when we yeah. got there. I mean that was a and um, Dream come true. Dream come true and we packed that moose out and he he laid down beside it and he was trying to, you know, hold stuff and help skin it and you know, later on, he, he actually was standing on his own at the camp. One, wow. One day I came out, he was on the front porch. He was standing on his own, and he hadn't stood for years. Wow. Yeah. And, wow. And The power of the healing yeah. that happened that yeah. week. Yeah. And then the the the, 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 the next, next hunt was another uh, young fellow that... Uh, was a prominent, um, going to be an all-star uh, baseball player, like top in college, and he ended up in a car accident and broke his back, and he wasn't going to play baseball anymore. But uh, he, he, I ended up getting him a wolf. I, I howled it because I was up glassing, and I heard this wolf, and I howled, came out, and he was with his dad, was helping him that time. And I snuck down there. I said, yeah, 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 take that wolf. You know? And he got a big gray wolf. And then I said, I didn't think that spot's lucky. I said, we're going to go back down there. Because a lot of times when you're you're running up in the river uh, with them, you don't realize how cold they're getting. Yeah, yeah. You know, so you always have to watch that. Anyways, I uh, I actually called a bull, and he got got a bull across the river. And uh, we we packed him in there and got pictures of that moose. I mean that that's yeah. that I felt was a major accomplishment, mm-hmm. not only oh for 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 them, but for you. But for me, guiding, I I stuck my neck out to to do that, and I've uh, oh, it's great. You know, n- makes n- you feel never good. never forgot that. I think that's a highlight of my guiding career, really. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, yeah. one of the highlights. Mm-hmm. So. Ron Raboud from Wounded Warrior Outdoors, he uh, was a big part of the sheep right. family. And I would go on bear hunts with them. And in this, the things that I saw those men and women overcome on the mountain. And I think the, the most beautiful part about hunting is uh, realizing how capable we are and in we, uh, wherever yeah. we are in life. And, right. the, and the mountain will really reveal to you how much deeper you can dig and how much harder you can push and how much farther you can really take your life if you choose. And then I feel like that really applies off the mountain into everything we do as humans. It does. Very, very true. You can, you just really don't realize how, what you can do. You mm-hmm. know, it's just a, it, you just don't do it. Mm-hmm. I'll have to tell you a little story. That was kind of rich. It may be kind of embarrassing, but <laughs> you can't embarrass him. But we was in Mongolia, and and uh, we was hunting, uh, come back to Bishkek, and Red's got the diarrhea. Oh, oh boy. Bad. We stopped bad, <laughs> real this, bad. <laughs> open country, flat country. We was along the railroad track. Red jumps out of the car and runs out and wide open. And he didn't comes care. Tr- he didn't comes, care. No, you don't care then. Here comes the train. Everybody was waving at him. <laughs> I turned I tur- all uh, right out in the middle of the desert. I thought, okay, this looks okay. I'm, uh, you know, and I'm like, oh man, my stomach and all this. And then I, here comes this train out of nowhere. <laughs> it was like an old west movie. Yeah. Here. And I turn around, and all the people are at the window <laughs> waving. They were, they were waving. All, everybody on that waving at him. Yeah. And I'm standing there, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was in a compromised position, we'll say. <laughs> we had, we had, 
We have a lot of laughs, you know. Well, you realize you're a long ways from BC <laughs> when you're, yeah. you're you don't have that if you have that same problem in the bush. <laughs> no, <laughs> you have to worry no. about a bear sneaking up on you out there. No. Not. No, <laughs> no. That's pretty funny. Yeah. Those are good times. These are the best times of our lives, right? Oh, yeah. You know, you're um, kidding. And I I really appreciate you both sharing a couple stories with us today. And I wish I could podcast the whole week that we were here because the stories that. Yogi and I have been privileged to partake in hearing, um, man, I, I feel like I was there in those stories and, um, it makes me, uh, want to head back out into hunting camp. That's for sure. Because, uh, it's, yeah. these are the things in, in people, when they see a trophy room like Jim's, they think, oh, well, that's, how do you have all those animals on your wall? And, and every one of them is attached to the best memories oh, of is. your life. It's all memories. That's yeah. The trophy is not much. It's memories mm-hmm. it's with me. Who you've been with, and mm-hmm. that's the, what counts, you know. It really does. And the fun you've had, because that just stands out, you know. Mm-hmm. And the trophy is just one small part. It just brings a memory out on you, you know. Picture yeah. the same way. The, mm-hmm. But it's who you've been with and, and the experiences you've had. And you just wish everybody could have it, you know. Yeah. And, brings you down in the world see you're pretty minor really mm-hmm. oh yeah makes you feel small yeah. we are small we're very oh, oh god what bronded me and jim is we were in elk camp one time and he would brought a little boy by the name of eli james who's 12 on an elk hunt and i was uh hosting that episode for rmef and jim and i sat down and we started talking i'd never met jim and leon and uh we had hunted the same places, but he would hunt with the generation before me and I would be hunting with their kids and, mm-hmm. and we knew the same people in the same mountains and some of the same rivers. And yeah. and I, I, and that's the beautiful part about hunting is it connects you to strangers oh, and does. you understand each other instantly without, even if you don't know them. No, that's why, it's stick, why we all stick together and mm-hmm. we got to, you know. Just and Jim, it. with his gun job, he even knew Bill Ruger. Oh yeah, back oh, yeah. in the day, and and I'm being part of the Ruger family, it, I mean, it's just so small. It's all connected, you know. Yeah, I got to meet Bill Ruger and Ed Nolan, who was with Ruger, and, and it was his vice president, general manager at that time, and great gentleman. I mean, I would really like to sit and talk to him because mm-hmm. we talked about old calibers, and I remember a lot of conversations you know, we had about. Uh, what calibers to build and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And they were gentlemen. Jim would, Jim would tell them, this is what we need for mountain guns. <laughs> this is what we need. And, yeah, and you d- probably had some sort of influence on, well, on firearms production from I, Ruger uh, uh, to I, some I, capacity. I remember Ed, Ed Nolan told me one time, if we can make a 1,000 uh, of like 257 Roberts or 7 millimeter, 7 by 57 and all that stuff. And I said, I'd take the first 20 you run, no matter what, you know, the calibers. And because these people, rifle people were, we like rifles. And uh, and we, I'm not happy last week got every caliber probably to try. Mm-hmm. So it's it brings back memories, and that's part of it. But it's great. People would come from all over the Midwest to come purchase firearms from Jim, not just because of, you know, him owning a gun store, but because he had so much experience in hunting and what it took yeah it, it was we built a business out of the rifles and and just hunting knowledge and and you try to share it with people and try to guide people right to mm-hmm. the right places there's been a lot of people we knew went rage a ton of people and uh, and you try to not send them problems mm-hmm. and you try to weigh through people and uh See whether they'd fit or not, mm-hmm. you know, and just try to help them out. And never made a dime off of it. It's just your convenience. You, you just couldn't give people. Yeah. yeah. It's all good stuff. Well, I sure love you, Jim and, and Leanne and Reg. It's been such an honor to get to know you and Anita. And well, thank you very much. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just what a, I mean, what an honor to sit down and talk with both of you. And I wish I could bring more to, to our listeners here today, be, <laughs> but we're kind of out of time. We actually have dinner plans tonight and Leanne's, uh, keeps tapping her wrist <laughs> up on the stairs for me to, to hurry up here. But, um, uh, I want to thank you guys both for, for sitting down and, and thank all of you for tuning in and listening to this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast. And I just want to invite all of you to like, share, subscribe. So if, if you liked 
listening to Jim and Reg stories today, I invite you to share this with someone else that you might think might also enjoy them. I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that, um, you know, would love to listen to the stories of some of the most iconic big game hunters in, in our lifetime, that's for sure. So thank you both for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thanks. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut podcast. If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.